Welcome, viewers, to our ongoing Nuclear Free Future conversation here in the Channel 17 newsroom in Burlington, Vermont. And viewers, I'm your, I'm your host, Margaret Harrington, on this ongoing conversation. And viewers, let's welcome together our guest, Les Cannett, Ph.D., from uh, the geologist in the Department of Environmental and Health Sciences at Johnson State College. Welcome, Les. Thank you for having me here. Thank you so much for coming, and, and we're asking a big question today. I know. Yeah. And when you spoke with me earlier about it, it really got me thinking. So it is a big question. There's a lot related to it. And the, the question that you asked is, what is the impact on Earth from the nuclear age? And it's broad. It's broad. We think about nuclear issues when you think about it, what, what comes to your mind? Nuclear. Well, yes. What, is that, what does it mean to you? Do you think of weapons as well, one impact on yes. yeah. um, nuclear power and nuclear medicine? Um, so when the question is, what is the impact on the Earth, I think it might be better phrased as, what is the impact on human societies? Because the Earth's evolved for billions of years, and it, the Earth isn't going to be affected by the use of nuclear power, but humans might be. So what we found is the nuclear power industry came out of the development of nuclear weapons. And we used to test nuclear weapons in the atmosphere, and that was banned uh, in a treaty of October of 1963 because we, know, we learned at that time that the unstable isotopes associated with nuclear weapons was harmful to humans. Well, what do you mean by isotopes? Isotopes. Uh, uh, what are, well, how are they in, in this picture? Right. So an, iso an isotope is a type of an atom. And well, here, let me, there's a history. There's a woman, her name's Madame Curie. Yes. She w did some early, she did some of the early original research on isotopes, meaning on radioactivity. She won the Nobel Pot Prize twice for this work, and she also died of cancer. Uh, she had a, a, one of her quotes was, nothing in life is to be feared, it is to only be understood. So in her search for the understanding of what is nuclear energy, in other words, what is radioactivity, she won the Nobel Prize, but it also killed her. So let me explain to you how a nuclear power plant works and what do we mean by isotopes. And it's that signature that we might recognize into the future, that, you know, a layer in the rock record that records this era in our history. Okay, well, just to go back a little bit there, are mm -hmm. you saying that Madame Curie died because of her work with radioactive radioactivity? Yes. With ra radioactivity? Yes, exactly. Okay. All right. So when we think of when you hear radioactivity, people are, get, are frightened by that term because we know it causes cancer. So that's generated by what we call unstable isotopes. Mm. These are big terms. So let me, let me show you what we mean by that. Everything that you can touch, everything in the world is made of atoms. Mm -hmm. And on this periodic table of the elements, you can see all the atoms, doesn't matter where you look in the universe, everything's made of these few atoms here. Mm. Now, if we take a, there are two numbers that we associate with atoms, and one is inside an atom are what we call protons. Inside the nucleus of an atom are protons, and we call that the atomic number. And we also have neutrons inside the nucleus of an atom. Mm. And those two factors al allow us to determine what isotope of an atom it is. Here's an example. Mm. Take a simple atom of hydrogen. Hydrogen, all atoms of hydrogen have one proton, which is this lower number that you see over here. Mm -hmm. Some isotopes of hydrogen have an additional neutron. Some have two neutrons. Some have three neutrons. Some have four neutrons. Those are all what we call isotopes of hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Now, it just so happens that the isotope with, that weighs three units, the one on the right, that we've named tritium is unstable. That means 
that the nucleus changes spontaneously and gives off radioactivity. So some isotopes are stable, like hydrogen and deuterium, and some are unstable, as are the other isotopes of hydrogen, hydrogen that weighs four units or five units or six units. When you, when you drink a glass of water, like we have here, mm-hmm. water has got a formula of H2O. Mm-hmm. That means there's hydrogen and oxygen in the water. The question is, which isotope of hydrogen are you drinking? Mm-hmm. And the answer is you're drinking all of them. So some of the hydrogen in this water is made of the isotope called tritium. It's unstable. It's radioactive. You're drinking radioactive water. Okay. But the percent of the tritium in this water is so low, it might not even be detectable. It exists, though. And therefore, you could be pretty confident that drinking this water, if we would test it, you'd see that tritium levels are low, is not going to give you cancer. But tritium is associated with nuclear power. We've probably heard about it with some of the leaks in Vermont Yankee. Right. Right here in in Vermont, we had uh, tritium leaks that were ongoing. Right. So what is that? A tritium leak means that the water that was coming out of the plant that was used for the power plant was enriched in that isotope of hydrogen called tritium. And tritium being unstable, meaning the nucleus spontaneously changes into other atoms, and in doing so, gives off energy. And that energy, when we ingest it, is is ionizing and turns our cells cancerous. Les, would you go into what is nuclear power? Right. So so that I can understand, or our viewers and myself can understand why uh, we are why they use the unstable isotopes okay. in, in, in generating nuclear power. Right. So um, this is the type of power plant that I would like to see. I'd like to see um, electricity being generated by wind or by water. Mm-hmm. And the way that power plant works, as you can see on this diagram, is that water goes into the system. It turns a turbine, usually behind a dam in a river, mm-hmm. or it could be a wind tower could be those fan blades. When we can turn the turbine, that turns a generator, which is just magnets and wires, and that generates electricity to power our homes. So to make electricity, you basically have two ways. You either turn a turbine that turns a generator to make electricity, or you use photovoltaic, the solar power cells. Right. But classically, historically, and predominantly, we're using we're making electricity by turning a turbine that turns a generator to make electricity. Okay. When we, we need a way to make that turbine rotate. So one way to do it with a nuclear power plant is we take the unstable isotopes here in the reactor vessel to boil water. That's all we use it for. Because when we can split an atom, it gives off energy That energy is heat. The heat boils water. When water flashes into steam, it's enough to turn the turbine. So then that steam that turns a turbine has to be cooled off so we could boil it again, so we could cool it off again, so we could boil it again. Because as we continue to boil the water, turn it into steam, condense it back into liquid, we can continue to turn that turbine. So in order to cool it down, we need to bring in river water. Mm-hmm. Now, what happens in the reactor chamber is we're changing the nuclei of atoms. Okay. And in doing so, we're producing nuclear waste and creating different isotopes, for example, isotopes of hydrogen like tritium. Okay, so now we are, we've, we've gotten to nuclear waste. Yeah, right. So already, right. and and uh, but uh, and, well, let, let's hold nuclear waste for a, a, a few minutes. Okay. And go back to uh, the concept of nuclear power came from the splitting of the atom and the the uh, atomic bomb. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So, so go ahead. So what? How? How did that 
to come about. I know, I know that okay. th that's a big, big question again. The only graffiti that you might see on bridges and in bathrooms that looks like physics is one of Einstein's equations, E equals mc squared. And what that equation means is that c is the speed of light, which is a really large number. Light moves really quickly. And if, when you square it, meaning when you multiply it by itself, a big number becomes a really big number. So if you take a really big number and multiply it by the m, a small change in mass, that change in mass when you split an atom, you get a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. So the basics of nuclear power and nuclear energy is you split the atom, you get a lot of energy. So what we tend to use for nuclear power and for nuclear energy is called uranium. Mm -hmm. There are many, many isotopes of uranium. And in nature, you could see that over 99%, if, you were to, if I was to give you 100 grams of uranium, 99.2% okay. of all those atoms would be the isotope uranium-238. A smaller percent would be uranium-235. A smaller percent would be uranium-234. And there are many other isotopes of uranium. Mm -hmm. In nuclear power and in nuclear weapons, we like to use the isotope of uranium called uranium-235. It's got just the right properties to split really easily. And when we split that atom, that's what gives off the energy to boil water. Okay. So what we do in preparing nuclear fuel is we mine uranium for minerals that have uranium. We concentrate the uranium. And then we concentrate the uranium-235, that isotope-235. So when we talk about enriched uranium, we're talking about uranium that has about 5% of the isotope of uranium-235. See, in nature, it's less than 1%. It's 0.7. But if we have enriched uranium, that's saying of all the uranium there, concentrate, using centrifuges primarily, the different isotopes and select uranium-235. If we want to make weapons, we have highly enriched uranium. And that's when we concentrate that isotope, uranium-235, to be in the order of 90%. So a little back up. So to boil water in a nuclear power plant, we need uranium-235. Mm -hmm. In nature, it exists in a very small percent. So we concentrate it. It's called enriched uranium. Okay. And then we control the reaction in a nuclear power plant so the it doesn't go out of control. In a nuclear weapon, we let it go out of control. We want to release a lot of energy quickly in a weapon. We want to release energy slowly in a nuclear power plant so we can continue to boil water to turn the generator to make electricity. So less as a geologist, mm. you study <laughs> the nature. <laughs> And yes. what, what happens right. naturally right. and in all of the evolution of time and the millions of years that you study. Right. But this is something that is not natural, right? The splitting of the atom was a man-made thing. This would, would this have happened naturally? Would the atom have been split naturally? And then a uh, man could have come and, and said, uh, oh, look at this wonderful thing. We'll make nuclear power out of it. We'll, we'll make bombs out of it. Right. So... The answer to that question is unstable isotopes, by definition, are unstable, meaning that they're always splitting. They're always decaying. Mm -hmm. But what we're doing in a nuclear power plant is we're concentrating that. Okay. So we use unstable isotopes to date items because we know how long it takes for things to decay. Mm -hmm. For example, again, if you look at uranium, uranium-235 has a half-life of 700, 7 times 10 to the 8th, that's 7 with 8 zeros after it. That's 700 million years. It's a long time. So that means these atoms are around for a long time. After one half-life, you have half of that. And another half-life, you have half of that. And it decays over time. But in, in nuclear power plants, we just have a, a large concentration of this. So the question, I think, is... is Again, is what, well, what what is the what is the what will what is the nuclear signature on on uh, on us? I see. All right. So because of the use of nuclear power, because you began it 
the beginning by saying that the uh, the nuclear impact we can't really see it. Right. Uh, but yet, so, with nuclear waste and uh, and the different uh, uh, terrible things that have happened, like with Chernobyl and and mm. Fukushima, I mean, this is this is an evident uh, signature that's left. Mm. Right, but it's local. It's local. not global. Okay. See, when we look at geological time, the idea is when you look at the layer upon layer upon layer of rocks, just like when you get the rest- the newspaper delivered to your home and you throw it in the pile. After about a year, if you want to look at the oldest paper, it's going to be on the bottom of the stack. Mm -hmm. Now, we can date how old rocks are by unstable isotopes, but when we're looking at geological time, we can also look at different life forms that exist in the rocks, and we know over time how life has evolved. So, um, if we look at the geological time scale, we know that the solar system that is the sun and the eight planets, all the asteroids in our in our in the solar system, the moons, all formed about 4.5 billion years ago. But it took about, and that's what we call, it took about four billion years of history for their first signs of life to show up on the planet. And when we date the different time periods, you can see something called the Precambrian. That means before life. And the Paleozoic is old life, and the Mesozoic is middle life. Mm-hmm. So when, if we just zoom in to the top part here um, of the geological time scale, Homo sapiens, like us, shown up only about 30,000 years ago. So geologically, we've only been here for an instant. So if we zoom into the uh, top part of the time scale here, you can see that about 540 million years ago, the first har- animals with hard parts showed up. And then we name these geological periods based upon... Uh, hold on. Less, uh, the, the first animals with what parts? Shells. Hard oh, parts. Oh, hard parts. Okay. Yeah, as opposed to just bacteria. Right, right. Okay. So we name these periods. See, here's the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic. And then we break it down into finer distinctions of time. Mm-hmm. And, we, and we name these periods and these epochs based upon primarily evolution of life forms. So, for example, the Cretaceous tertiary boundary over here that separates the middle life from the ancient life, 66 million years ago, that's what took out all the dinosaurs. It was a major impact. A 10-kilometer-wide, 6-mile-wide asteroid that hit in the Gulf of Mexico, and it left a chemical signature on the entire planet. One of the elements we can measure has a peak, and all the rocks of that age and it's a signature that took out about 45% of all the life all life on the planet at the time, plus has a chemical signature. So nuclear power plants are having local issues. There's nothing globally global about it yet, except for nuclear weapons testing. That atmospheric change in one of the isotopes is a signature, but it might not be long-lived enough for us when organisms in the future look back in the rock record and say, oh, what happened, you know, 10 million years ago, which would be today for us? Right. Is there a signature? What, what marks that time? Is nuclear power going to be a defining moment in human history that accounts for the rapid rate of species extinction that we're seeing today? I mean, there, if you think about geological time, the... There have been many times when when species have gone extinct, and they've gone extinct. Um, sorry, I, I, my mistake here. There have been many times when species have gone extinct throughout the rock record, but today the background rate of species extinction is about 500 to 1,000 times greater than it's ever been, and it's not because of an impact like most of these, from an asteroid or a comet. So what's causing this rapid rate of extinction is how we live. And is nuclear power the cause, or is it a cause? Nuclear power isn't killing that many people. We know that it kills people, and we know that it's unsafe. We know that people working in nuclear power plants have issues. Madame Curie died from just studying it. But if we're going to mark a new period in the geological timescale, we'll, we'll need a chemical signature. 
we'll also need to know that there's a change in species. So what's killing all these species on the planet right now, nuclear power might only be one small aspect of it, but it might be a signature in the rock record that we could look back on, assuming that there's an intelligent life form that evolves beyond our time, to look back and say, that's the, sp that's the point right there in the rock record where the sp human species and others have gone extinct, and this chemical signature might be an unstable isotope from nuclear power, but it might not be the cause of it. Are you saying that we uh, people have the power to, uh, to lessen the impact of... Uh, of, of the uh, nuclear age? We are an amazing species. We've, we've done such amazing, made amazing changes to the planet. Um, if we were to, if we could step 10 million years into the future and look back, you know, what would we see from how we lived? And there'd be lots of things that we do, and there'd be a lot of unstable isotopes related to nuclear power that will still be in existence, but they'll be in patches where we're storing our nuclear waste all over the planet. That might be something that would say, look what they did. They, they we'll also probably see lots of concrete and railroads right, and right. oil wells, and uh, we'd probably see lots of disturbed soils from farming. We would, might see there'll be lots of plastics you know, right, bits and pieces of plastics that might make this one thin layer in the rock record. So nuclear, our use of nuclear power and waste would still be in that one thin little band in the rock record. But it might be where we can, like, put that golden spike to say this is the, the time period which we're going to give a new name to a new age, and we were thinking of calling it the Anthropocene, which is based on the term itself, if you break down, means life changes related to human species. So what have we done to change the planet? Is there some signature that we could say, hey, this is a new geological time period? Well, but do you agree that this is a new geological time period? I, I think that we've made significant changes on the planet. What of it will be recorded and preserved in the rock record in the future? I don't know what those signatures will be, but certainly we're making significant change to the environment in which we live and that's and and we have a very limited range of tolerance. I need clean water, I need healthy food, I need a certain temperature to survive. And as we change those conditions, our species will will die out, just like they have throughout the rock record. So we are making a, a difference to the conditions on this planet. It will be recorded in the rock record, but the question is, what will be that signature? Is it going to be some of the unstable isotopes related to nuclear power or nuclear weapons? It could be. If there are a lot of Chernobyl and Fukushima-like disasters in the next 100 years, that might be enough to make a significant worldwide record that would be observable in the rocks in the future. In the meantime, it would be killing all of us who are living in the area. Right. Not real hopeful. I mean, no. think about it. We've, throughout geological time, we've not been here for very long, human species. And we've made significant changes to the environment that are not beneficial for our survival or the survival of other species. Les, when do you see the... Uh, are you agreeing that uh, we are we have entered into the Anthropocene age? Again, there's there's a there's a working group called the Anthropocene Working Group, trying to define what that might mean. You know, to to have a new geological time period, we need um, a marker. What we call like the golden spike. This is the time when there's been a change. If if it is, maybe we maybe it started 40,000 years ago, when we were um, when we took out mammoths and mastodons and giant sloths and all those charismatic megafauna that we see in the La Brea tar pits, or maybe we could say it started 
2,000 years ago with all the smelting of lead and all the Ro when, during the Roman period. Or we could say maybe it started 70 years ago when we exploded our first nuclear weapon, the Trinity event. It's, it's um, we have to, f in that time period of 10, I started 40,000 years ago, a couple thousand years ago, geologically that's an instant. So where is it that the humans started making that impact on, on life? I don't know where that time period is. There is, a, as I said, there is a group trying to define what it should be. And it might be the carbon-14 signature from atmospheric nuclear testing being the marker, the chemical marker, that defines a time period in the Earth history where humans made such great, great changes to the planet that are noticeable in the rock record and preserved. It seems that we're, when we're talking about the Anthropocene age, we're talking about more, that man, man has more control over what will happen. We have, oh, sure. Whereas before, you know, comets were, uh, and asteroids fell, and still do, but uh, things seem to be so out of control and, and uh, gave birth to all kinds of mythologies and, and fears that could not be uh, answered. Like these, these terrible things happened and people didn't know, it, was it the wrath of God? Right. What was it, fate, whatever. Right. But now, we, it's, it, with the Anthropocene age, if that's what we really are in, there seems that, it seems that we should have more control. Do you think that we do? Control over our destiny? Yes, uh, over, the, over the, the fate of the Earth. Um, I don't know how to answer that question. Um, <laughs> Um, we have control over our own actions. Yeah. And some of the actions that we take aren't necessarily beneficial to our survival or th the survival of other species. But we still make decisions on a daily basis over everything. I, we need these lights in here. Mm. We could decide to do this outside and use natural light. Right. But we don't. So where are these electrons coming from that are making this electricity that we're using? So we do have a choice, but a lot of times we live with blinders because it's easier not to make a choice. Les, you, you've seen a lot of uh, in your studies up in Spitsbergen by the Arctic Circle. Could you tell us something about that? Right. So mm. Spitsbergen is north of northern Norway, mm. north of the Arctic Circle. Um, it's northeast of Greenland. I go up there for 10 weeks at a time. It's, uh, the place is covered in glaciers and rocks. There are no trees. There are polar bears, seals, birds, and whoever you go up there with. Mm. So it's... What when I first went out there, my first season, and we're, we come in th from a small plane, and you look down on the land, and you see these snow-covered mountains poking through the clouds, and you know you're going to be left there just with you and your partner for ten weeks. You realize that you have more. S you wonder what's important. You you have time to consider what's important in life, and what what do you really need out of life to survive. It's humbling. It's good training for Vermont winters, but it's it's a <laughs> it's a, it's um, it makes you appreciate good food and good friends. And the, the results of the studies there are gradual, right? Oh, so the st what we were looking at geologically was how did these mountains evolve? That was the question. Mm -hmm. It wasn't even, and the problem was they were just too many glaciers in the way to see the rocks. Here in Vermont, we have too many trees to see the rocks. Mm -hmm. So um, the questions that we were looking at is uh, larger questions about the evolution of mountain belts. And the mountains that we find in Spitsbergen are closely related in time and in process 
to the mountains that we have here in the Appalachian and Caledonides in Europe. They all formed at the same time when the early, when the Proto-Atlantic Ocean closed. The ocean, if you look at a map of the world, you'll see it looks like North America and South America fit nicely with Europe and Africa like a puzzle piece. Mm. And indeed they did, and they're moving apart a little faster than the rate at which your fingernails grow. So we were looking at, that, and we can date these events using unstable isotopes, and we're, we're looking at how these mountains evolved over time and what does it mean for the evolution of the planet. It, nothing that has a direct effect on how we live today. Right, right. It's not like nuclear power. The, the choices that we make today with nuclear power have, have significant and long-term effects on how we live in terms of how we're going to deal with that waste because it's going to persist for a lot longer than we'll be here. On that note, I think that we will end this conversation, which seems so short, and with, with such a long view into the past and into the future. Thank you so much. A pleasure. Les. Thanks for inviting me. And I hope that maybe sometime you will come back and, uh, and uh, elucidate us and shine a light on everything for thank us you. again. Thank you. It'll be a pleasure. Thank you so much. And thank you, viewers. Till next time. Goodbye. <laughs>